I'm going to welcome Dr. Stan Bovid back to the podium today. Uh, yesterday, he made a great presentation on laser peen forming and some of the work that's being done in that arena. Uh, today, he'll be talking about more of the modeling and simulation for laser shock peening. Uh, Stan serves as the Director of Materials Research at LSP Technologies, where he manages application development engineering for customers and oversees the company's material science center of excellence, which offers a wide range of testing and measurement instrumentation to reveal strategies and benefits for improving metal components. Stan holds uh, an advanced degree in mechanical engineering, materials engineering with his PhD that he uh, recently earned from the Ohio State University. Uh, his expertise includes metallurgy, structural mechanics, and computational modding, modeling for uh, industrial metals. With that, Stan, the floor is yours. Thanks, David, and uh, hello to everyone again. Uh, happy to talk uh, some additional information today on, on modeling simulation of the laser shock peening process. Uh, we've already heard a couple of great talks on this. so. Uh, you know, I think our presentation from LSP technology side is maybe more how we use this in our industrial applications. And I've got some examples to, to walk through how it's used uh, at LSPT. Uh, you've, you've probably heard about how we're uh, developing laser peening applications for a wide variety of, of uh, new endeavors, right? So we're now uh, getting out into actual field laser peening services. Uh, no longer just providing the uh, in-house job shop, you know, one size fits all type laser peening systems uh, that have been so common in the past. So really, the, you know, this ever expanding list of applications that we're working on really demands that we have some optimization. And that's not only in component performance, but also in the economics of the laser peening process. Uh, throughout the presentations, there's been some talk about, you know, costs associated with, with implementing laser peening and uh, developing uh, equipment solutions that help meet the requirements for, uh, for a component rather than maybe the ultimate, uh, ultimate benefit that laser peening can provide are, are pretty important. Um, so ultimately, the, the process conditions that are used in laser peening uh, really can influence the equipment design. And there hasn't been a lot of studies in the areas outside of uh, organizations that have one specific laser available and you know, with that system available, what can you do with it? Uh, at LSPT, we want to start to push those boundaries. You know, what are the ultimate uh, optimum conditions that we can use for treating a product uh, to make it as efficient and effective as possible? Uh, so this optimization goes beyond just the laser energy. We need to take into account the number of layers that we're applying, the spot size, uh, laser pulse width, overlays. And, and just as an example, uh, there's been some, some mention of using uh, laser peening to replace uh, shot peening for uh, you know, high throughput types of applications. Uh, we've done some work in exploring that field at 200 hertz. So ultimately for uh, innovating the laser peening process, we need to have the modeling and simulation tools available. And, and a little bit how we get there, uh, you know, anybody that's working in this field is, is well aware of, of some of our options, but just wanted to give a quick review on this. Right, so how do we tie our laser peening parameters into residual stress? What is that actual Know, process flow look like? What are the techniques available? And how do we get there? Everything that we're doing now, you know, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, all of the information that's been created uh, in the past has led us uh, to using the techniques we have available now. Um, we've already heard some great talks on the history of laser peening uh, from Alan Clower yesterday, uh, Dr. Who last night, uh, Dr. Okanya this morning and Dr. Malik, Dr. Fitzpatrick have all uh, really helped advance you know, the science of modeling the laser peening process. Uh, so without, without them, you know, we wouldn't have uh, any of the capabilities that we do now. Uh, 
there's many you know, other individuals that have made significant contributions to, to the modeling and simulation that I'm not mentioning here. Um, I think the only shout out that I would probably give is, is additionally to the, the French researchers um, really who helped to define some of the initial uh, process boundaries and the science behind it uh, that unfortunately weren't able to make it uh, to the conference today. Uh, so at LSP Technologies, we use both the eigenstrain method and explicit dynamic simulations that have been discussed uh, in some, some uh, additional capacity during the conference so far. Uh, with our eigenstrain modeling, we use the eigenstrain uh, for applications where we, we've done some work before. Um, eigenstrain models are typically built off of residual stress measurements on simple coupons. Um, and then once those eigenstrain profiles are developed from the simple geometries, you can start to evaluate uh, how more complex shapes will respond uh, to the eigenstrain. Uh, eigenstrain simulations are, are rapid, so they can provide uh, indications of the residual stress profiles uh, in fractions of the time that explicit methods uh, take. And just a little bit of how, how we do that internally. Uh, so we have a database of treatments for uh, for different combinations of laser peening and uh, the materials to which those laser peening treatments have been applied. We simulate that with thermal strain inside of ANSYS. Um, <clears throat> and just as an example, the bottom left is an animation uh, showing the progressive development of the uh, residual stress field uh, as we apply laser peening spots uh, and, and walk around the circumference of of this disk. Uh, when we don't have eigenstrain models available, or you know, if we're looking at uh, new material processing for which we haven't worked on before, uh, if we're looking at complex shockwave interactions, that's when we turn to explicit dynamics. Um, so explicit dynamics, we're able to uh, simulate the pressure pulses that are generated by the laser peening process on the surface of the materials. We can then evaluate how that material responds uh, to those input pressures from laser peening. And then from there, we can extract out uh, eventual residual stress profiles. Uh, in, in these cases, you know, computational resources for explicit dynamics are uh, substantially <laughs> higher. Uh, often, at least an order of magnitude longer in their simulation time uh, compared to the eigenstrains. Uh, I'm not going to walk through you know, our entire modeling approaches, but just to give you an idea of the, the way our modeling and simulation activities fit into predicting fatigue life down the line, we kind of have two modules that we use in our uh, overall scheme. So there are explicit modeling space has a, a large variety of parameters that goes into it. Um, the eigenstrain modeling space has, has some of the same elements, just you know, uh, tracking laser peening parameters as well as your part geometry. But overall, it, it's much simpler uh, in, its, uh, in its application. So you know, one of the questions that's often out there is, you know, which method is best? Uh, and there is no there's no simple answer there. It really depends on what our end goals of what we're trying to simulate and understand about a process uh, are. So they both have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and to go over some of the usage of the eigenstrain and where we see the strengths and weaknesses, um, I've got a couple of examples. So how the eigenstrain models are created, uh, this is going through the actual uh, empirical approach to the eigenstrain creation. So we'll first apply different laser peening treatments to a simple sample. So whether this is a, a per, potentially the end face of a cylinder or a basic block geometry, uh, we apply a very simple uh, surface treatment uh, pattern to that where we can measure the residual stresses. Uh, after we measure the residual stresses, if you know what the simple geometry was, you can then uh, derive what the eigenstrain leading to those residual stresses looks like. And that is what we save 
uh, into our database as far as uh, the eigenstrain generated by a given laser peening process for a given material. And there's some geometry bounds to that as well. Uh, so with this, we can then start to evaluate uh, the effects of laser peening on, on different applications. So at, at LSP Technologies, we use eigenstrain to evaluate how, uh, how resi residual stresses will develop in new applications. So maybe new geometries that we haven't worked with before uh, for similar alloys that we've used. Uh, one of the big uses for us is really in how do you optimize a treatment area uh, for a given application to maximize the residual stresses? Uh, and, and we'll see how treatment area as a function of your sample geometry matters uh, in a couple of slides here. And then if you're able to uh, participate in the peen forming webinar yesterday, uh, there, there's a lot of examples, I think both by LSP Technologies and uh, Dr. Hu on how eigenstrain can be used uh, to predict uh, peen forming, uh, peen forming applications. So I, well, one example that we wanted to show for the eigenstrain, which we don't see a lot of in, uh, in much of the literature is, is the prediction of residual stresses in very thin uh, sample geometries. So when we're down uh, into the millimeter, submillimeter thickness range, uh, how, is eigenstrain applicable in dual-sided applications? And what are the actual effects? Uh, so for Pi 64 thin geometries. This is target tor targeted towards uh, turbine airfoil applications. Uh, the eigenstrain profile uh, was derived on a 50 thousandths thick coupon, so about one and a quarter millimeter uh, thick sample. Uh, these were processed uh, with uh, with an opaque overlay. Um, the residual stresses were measured uh, by an external party in this case. Uh, this was done with, at uh, Proto Manufacturing. So while LSPT does have internal residual stress measurement capabilities, uh, this was done through a third, third party to keep it, uh, yeah, I guess, to, to keep it open to, um, you know, having any, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a more objective uh, analysis. Um, so what we can see is you know, we've, we've calculated that eigenstrain profile uh, based off of uh, the residual stresses that's reported in the top left chart on our screen. And then we applied that same laser peening treatment on dual sides to both a 30,000 thick uh, flat plate, as well as a simulated airfoil coupon. And then we're able to compare the uh, predicted residual stresses for uh, for those two geometries against our, uh, uh, compare the experimental and predicted values. Uh, there's a couple things to note, right, that the eigenstrain model predicts that may not always be intuitive to, uh, to those new to laser peening or surface enhancement techniques, um, and even to some of the modeling activities, right, and that is how does your geometry impact the residual stress magnitudes that you see. Um, so our model is based on the 50,000 stick coupon, as I mentioned, which has about a 70 KSI uh, compressive stress at the surface and has a zero crossing uh, that's around 40, uh, well, near the mid thickness of, of this sample. And so it's almost a uh, through thickness compressive stress that's developed by this treatment. And then when we uh, look at the 30,000 thick sample, what we see is a significant drop in your surface residual stress. So instead of having our 70 KSI at the surface, we're only down to uh, 45 KSI. And then the actual profile uh, in this material is going to uh, change as well. And when we look at the airfoil coupon with this same treatment, we're up above 100 KSI. So just by changing the sample geometries, we're experiencing uh, changes in the magnitude of residual stress. 
And this really goes back to how the geometry is elastically responding uh, to the plastic strain induced by the process. So the greater availability of plastic, uh, well, the greater magnitude of plastic strain uh, can lead to higher residual stresses in some cases if your geometry supports it. If it doesn't, uh, you, you will actually have drops in residual stress magnitudes if, if the elastic volume is insufficient. Uh, this is kind of a, the same idea you see in laser peen forming. If, if your geometry is a limiting factor uh, as far as how the material responds, we get deformation. If we have competing plastic strain profiles in uh, thin materials, it'll have a similar uh, type of effect. So how do we actually use this? You know, what, what things can we do now that we have a validated eigenstrain profile? Uh, so if we look at that same sample coupon geometry for our, our uh, simulated airfoil, what we can look at is how varying our treatment patch sizes can actually impact the internal residual stress profile uh, within this blade. And what's shown uh, in, this, in this chart is the oops, uh, mid cord uh, profile along the, along the center line and how the residual stress profile changes simply by altering the area that has been laser peened. Uh, so depending on what the, the intent is, what the problem we're trying to solve with laser peening uh, may influence what, uh, what parameter we're using uh, as far as treatment area. At LSPT, once we have this residual stress profile, uh, we've done some work in developing uh, probabilistic life calculators uh, that can compare baseline and laser peen samples uh, based on statistical data populations. Uh, we've done predictions and testing. Uh, this is, these results are specific to the actual uh, airfoil testing. This is a simple three-point bending configuration and just comparing our uh, predicted values against our experimental results. Another example that, that we can use with the laser peening process is, uh, again, trying to design a treatment unique to an application. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at some compact tension samples. Uh, there's some great work shown earlier today on uh, you know, slowing the fatigue crack growth rates. Um, this eigenstrain portion really isn't on uh, quantitatively assessing uh, the fatigue crack growth rates, more of a uh, demonstrating the benefits of laser peening and how the uh, treatment locations can be used to, to show the capabilities of the process in reducing growth rates. Um, so in this case, what we've done is that this is a very thick or a thin uh, compact tension sample. Uh, this one itself is only about a millimeter and a half thick. Um, and the intention here is if you're looking at, you know, airfoils, uh, you know, and a customer says, I want proof that uh, laser peening is going to uh, be to my benefit for my application. Uh, this is what they had requested. So uh, because this is a thin geometry, there are some challenges in ensuring that we have the maximum residual stress profiles available to uh, mitigate you know, crack growth rates. Uh, so in this application, we use laser peening to you know, devise a treatment that is going to show it. Uh, they had previously looked at two other types of laser peening treatments, one being a just processing the intended crack growth line. Uh, in that testing, they didn't see really any benefit compared to their baseline testing. Uh, because this was such a thin geometry when they did a patch treatment, similarly, there was really no clear benefit of laser peening. Um, this, this has to do with how you know, those plastic strain profiles are induced on a thin sample. Uh, so that's why we devised our our specific treatment here, uh, having this striped pattern of laser peening, where you provide a, an area for the compensating tensile stresses uh, to develop uh, within the material while balancing out the maximum compressives that can be occurred. The 
theoretical uh, estimate of, of what's going to occur as far as crack growth. You know, we, we predicted in a, a simple basis here, uh, just diagrammed uh, what we expect to see happen. And then our actual testing, which was completed uh, by some of our colleagues at the Guangdong University of Technology. Uh, you can see the oscillatory nature uh, of the crack growth rate as that crack growth extends into uh, our laser peen treated areas as well as uh, into the compensating tensile zones. So uh, this is you know, a couple of examples of where we can use eigenstrain to our benefit. Uh, obviously, this, this continues into a lot of other applications, not just thin geometries, uh, but because thin geometries are much more sensitive to the laser peening treatments, um, it, it's one of our highest use areas. Um, so really strength-wise on eigenstrain, you know, we can get accurate predictions of residual stresses uh, as long as those models have been you know, well-developed. Uh, we're able to evaluate a, a large variety of combinations of materials very quickly. So whether we want to evaluate a change in treatment area, um, see how any change in geometry from, from a manufacturer for a part, you know, may influence the LSP results. Uh, all of that can be done very quickly. Uh, but really our weaknesses with eigenstrain is that every eigenstrain model we create is going to be uh, bounded to a material thickness and a specific LSP condition and a target material. So extending uh, at eigenstrain material models is a little bit difficult. Uh, most of these, as I mentioned, are built off of residual stress data. And so while we can uh, you know, transfer explicit simulation data to, to eigenstrain, that's um, that's not how it's always done. Um, and I think the preferred approach is often to use uh, experimental data here. Uh, but to that end, because we're, you know, we're not really able to push the boundaries of laser peening as a process, uh, you know, process capability with laser peening with the eigenstrain model, because we're bound by what we already have. And so while we can optimize laser peening treatments for applications, uh, with with the eigenstrain, uh, it's still not it's still not going to give us you know, the next innovation for laser shock peening itself. Uh, and as a final note, we're also not capturing the material physics that are occurring uh, during the laser shock peening process. So uh, some of the benefits that you'll see with cold working or the increases in the actual material strength properties. Um, might not come through. And then in, you know, in complicated thin geometries, you're not going to see some of those reflected shockwave effects, uh, at least in a dynamic, uh, dynamic method. So if we start to compare these results to uh, our, our dynamic modeling, you know, we use, uh, I think maybe Dr. Malik might comment on this in a little bit, but uh, this is a kind of a 2n plus one type of simulation process that we use. Um, this is looking at how laser peening responds to new materials, uh, if there's any dynamic concerns, um, and then ways that we can further optimize the process. Um, you know, the, the important things in the modeling, an explicit process really comes down to the plasma pressure and our plastic strain gradients. Uh, in the end, that's what really leads to the residual stresses. And uh, as uh, Dr. Okanya mentioned this morning, you know, the peak pressure model that's used in these simulations, uh, the most common is, is the one discussed uh, and presented by Fabro in the 90s. Uh, you know, the real issue here is, is this relevant for our range of applications uh, and our model domain at LSPT? So we use uh, potentially bare overlay, well, bare processing, vinyl tapes, metal tapes. And we can range our pulse width from five to 25 nanoseconds and power density is from zero to 12. Um, so how do we account for all this? We've done some measurement characterization work, to see what 
what is accurate. And we find that for bare processing, uh, you know, what's presented out there is, is great. Uh, it, it has very good agreement uh, with our experimental data, right, as well as many others around the globe. Um, it's generally agnostic to the material that we're processing. So uh, we can use this in our simulations uh, quite freely. Um, but when we start to look at our overlays, so again, we use adhesive back overlays, which are tape. Right? We find some things that don't agree with what we, we have commonly assumed in the past. And that's as a function of pulse width, we get drastically different peak pressures generated by the laser peening process. Uh, and that these have really no correlation to uh, reflected shock approximations that are used uh, in, in some pretty, uh, pretty common shock dynamics studies. Uh, I think the other thing to note, right, this is aluminum tape on an aluminum alloy. Uh, and the green line is approximately what you would see of just processing aluminum bare. And we see substantial variations both uh, above and below this prediction based on the laser pulse width that we used. So for this, we needed a different type of physics process. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but basically what we've done uh, is solve this as, as a impulse launch flyer type of problem where the laser peening uh, is really driving the opaque overlay as a flyer just with some simple simulations to show how this is, is done. You can see how uh, our shock wave is, is traveling through in it, our opaque layer and an adhesive and then our target material. Uh, this is a, this article is available online. Uh, I think it's still in its free period if anyone is interested in learning more. All right, so what can we do with this? We have our new pressure model. We can look at pressure equivalence across different power densities and pulse widths. This is showing a, a five gigawatt uh, peening treatment at 20 nanoseconds with black tape and a 10 gigawatt treatment at 13 nanoseconds. Um, and basically they generate the same residual stress profile. Uh, similarly, similarly uh, if we compare a 10 gigawatt, six nanosecond and a two and a half gigawatt, 20 nanoseconds, this is in uh, TIE 6.4 they generate the same profile. These are very low because the peak pressures generated here are only around three GPA. So it's very close to the Higonio elastic limit. Uh, so with this, we're able to compare system to system and process process equivalents, um, which really isn't that common, uh, commonly done in laser peening. Uh, obviously we can do thick sample residual stress simulations with this. Um, I think it's interesting to note that if we do 10 gigawatt processing with black vinyl tape, and then our bare processing, how these profiles are different. Uh, so this is, this is not just a function of the thermal mechanical effects of your opaque overlay uh, versus a bare processing. Uh, this is the actual pressure magnitudes generated. Um, this bottom left chart is, is a, a 2D view. So this is generated off of diffraction data. Uh, the other thing we can do now is, is track how uh, shock waves interact inside of the material. So we're able to predict where any peak reflections may occur. And this can be incorporated into damage models inside of our, uh, inside of our explicit dynamic simulation to, to make sure that any uh, potential detrimental effects uh, of a laser driven shock wave are avoided. So it, I'm about out of time. So strengths, you know, we, we can do a lot with the explicit dynamics models. Really, the biggest weakness is just the computational time associated with it. Uh, and internally, where we view this process, uh, really feels like we're capturing all of the, uh, you know, the physics that we're interested in at this point. Um, really, our next steps is in uh, building out our uh, probabilistic uh, you know, statistical distributions associated with the different factors we're looking at in uh, laser peening. So that is the end. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Bovid. Appreciate that. I have one quick question maybe you can answer. Actually, I had a couple, but since we're out of time before our next talk, uh, Dr. Clower talked about some of the modeling with this plastic strings that uh, they were measuring and then analytically modeling. Is any of that modeling still valid or helpful for what we're trying to accomplish today? 
I think so. You know, a lot of that initial you know, modeling is still still very accurate. I think back in the time, uh, you know, paint was a very common overlay, right? and, and you know, in a finite element solver, they're all using the same equations in their solutions. So I, I don't think that uh, actual actual mathematical calculations here have changed much, right? It's really in the efficiency of the process, uh, and, the, and Dr. Malik may touch on that. So okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate